Well, for anyone that's watching today, if you're around the university around the, uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, this, uh, this guest may need no introduction. It's the world famous Dove Ribnik, um, soccer alum and now producer of Nitro Circus. Dove, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Pat. No problem. Uh, so let's start before we get into you know, the discussion around the university, what you're doing now. Um, why don't you tell people a little bit about what Nitro Circus is, just for those who don't know? Yeah, Nitro Circus, uh, it's kind of an, an, an action sports, sort of as an action sports kind of DVD series. It's basically, a, a group of friends started filming these DVDs and over the course of many years grew into a TV show on MTV and a movie uh, and um, then a live tour where we tour the world, you know, performing live shows. But, you know, at, at the core, it's, just, it's a group of friends who share the love of having fun and pushing limits in the sports, you know, that, that they participate in, which is all action sports based around, you know, motorsports uh, and just kind of anything with wheels. So it's just a, it's a group of friends who just have a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, well, we'll talk more about that. But I guess, you know, since it's a JU show, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the university first. Yeah. So, like I said, soccer alum. Um, and I know you're from uh, the Boston area up northeast. So why don't you talk a little bit about um, just discovering the university and, and why you chose to go to JU? Yeah, I mean, it was a long, long time ago, so I'm <laughs> a little, a little hazy. But um, you know, coming out of high school, I mean, I wasn't recruited too heavily to play soccer. I, I think I walked, I walked on at JU. Um, but you know, I talked to them before, but. You know, it was just one of the schools that it caught my eye just because it was I wanted to get out of the Northeast and I wanted to to get down south and be near water. And there's a few schools that I talked to that I could have walked on to and, and Jay had chose JU and it couldn't have been a better fit. Like it was just got to play soccer, got to be in warm weather, got to be near the water, kind of ticked all the boxes. There you go. Well, yeah. one of the things we've we've had some guys that have been in our era on obviously Brian Williams, which again beat up but it's hard to say Brian Williams, but we'll say it. Um, you know, we've had people on from our era and you know, one of the things we've talked about is the family mentality that happens in the athletic department. So yeah. it's not, you know, people sitting in these silos where, you know, baseball only talks to baseball, soccer only hangs out with soccer. It was really kind of that, that cross pollination, if you will, where, you know, everyone kind of supported each other and we'd go to different games. Um, and you were certainly part of that for, for me when I first got there, you know, being friends with a lot of the guys that were upperclassmen. Um, so we got to spend a lot of time together. And, you know, when you think about the university as a whole and being on, you know, a smaller campus, what are some of the things that you liked about, you know, having more of that intimate setting? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the beauty of it right there is, is how, it's how small it is. You know, you have your friends that go to big schools and, you know, I just don't think they got the same experience that we did. Um, like you said, it, it was a very inclusive setting with all different sports kind of befriending each other. And I'm still great friends with other people I you know, didn't play soccer with today. And I just, I just was drawn to that and just grew to love it. Like over the, I think five years I was there. <laughs> um, I just, yeah, I just, I just loved it. Like it was just, it was a great environment to, to grow. And, you know, when you're 18, 19, 20, it was just that small environment having that you know, small knit community, like you said, I just found it perfect for me. It was, it was ideal. There you go. Well, you and I are the same. We both took five years to get through. And I think we <laughs> love the university so much. We just had to stick around as long as we <laughs> exactly. could. I think exactly. Van Wilder, the movie was actually, yeah. you know, based on you and me, whoever that guy was at Florida State, it was actually us probably. Yeah, a lot of similarities. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, obviously. So, um, so let's talk about the transition. I know you didn't just, you know, graduate and all of a sudden jump into Nitro Circus. So, I know that you started doing things in film communications kind of right off the bat. So why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, graduating, figuring out, okay, now what do I do up to where you are now? Um, yeah, I mean, so coming out of, out of JU, you know, I think one of the great things about JU is it does get you ready. It got me ready for the outside world. And I think, you know, I decided to stay in Florida um, and was lucky enough to get a job through a guy I met playing soccer, Alex Boylan, um, who you should have on here someday, uh, got me a job at a production company in Jacksonville called Pine Ridge Film and Television, uh, doing sales for their stock footage library. I knew nothing about TV. I knew nothing about sales. I knew nothing about stock footage. I knew nothing about libraries. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but, yeah, but I knew, uh, I, I knew uh, AB who, who got me the job. And, and also he got me the job through 
the CFO there was a guy called Johnny Howard who played baseball at JU as well. So again, it kind of all ties back and kind of being there quickly, you know, over the span of a few months, I realized this is something I really was into and kind of fell in love with production. And over the course, of, I think I worked there for about five years, uh, worked my way up from just being, you know, below a PA to a PA, which is a production assistant, to an associate producer, to a writer, to a field producer. Uh, and eventually, you know, by the time I left, I was traveling around the world to these guys uh, producing shows all over South America and Europe. And just, it was just the best experience ever. And that's really what kind of set me on my path in the, the entertainment world was working with those guys, you know, especially Jerry and Cindy Smith, the two owners of the company and just, you know, using every second I had with them to kind of sponge up all the knowledge they had. And like, they were just so good about teaching me. Cause again, I was a kid that just didn't know anything about production or, <laughs> stock production or libraries or TV or anything. And I just I wanted to learn. And they saw that, you know, I had that the hunger to learn about their industry and they, they really, you know, went above and beyond in teaching me. That's awesome. So yeah. at, at what point did you transition out of that? And, you know, I know, like you said, you were here for a while and then, you know, honestly, I, I don't really know the path from there, but I know you left and I know you spent time overseas and, you know, from afar, you know, I've seen you at some weddings and things like that. Um, but as far as, you know, how did that turn into traveling all over the place and, and doing things on such a large scale? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, so, I finished, I think it was there about five years and just kind of was at that level where I was like, all right, um, I kind of wanted to keep progressing in TV and production. And, you know, I think it's no, no surprise that Jacksonville's not the, you know, the media hub of the world. So I'd said, you know, I'm going to pack up my bags. I'm going to go to LA. I'm going to give it a shot. Like this is, you know, I'm young. I'm gonna, this is my chance. I'm going to go and, and try to become a, a producer out in LA. So I like literally packed up my car uh, and lived in my car, the same car I still have now, drove out to LA, was living in my car and was taking interviews to try and get uh, jobs. I was, you know, occasionally sleeping on friends' floors, but for lack of a better time, I was living in my car for a few weeks. And I think my second interview was with uh, Nitro Circus and it was with a guy called Trip Taylor, who is still a very close friend of mine. Um, and they had just started this show called Nitro Circus on MTV. They just started filming, went in for an interview. They didn't need anyone. Um, I just, you know, we just, chatted wrapped out he's actually from my hometown up in cape cod so we kind of okay. you know wrapped over that for a while and he's like hey if something comes up i'll let you know the next day he's like how soon can you start we need a position filled and i just said i'm, I'm living in my car i could be there in five minutes Literally drove across the valley, <laughs> got there and started working and it was just like it was kind of like it's very different than being at pine ridge and at ju but it was just like such a natural fit like i just felt at home with those guys and we were working out of the dick house office which is the jackass guys they were still doing jackass stuff on one floor. Nitro floor was the other one. And, you know, I felt, and I felt kind of just at home there. Like it was just the environment of like, they're so welcoming and inclusive and yeah, they screwed around a lot and there's a lot of pranks happening and a lot of practical jokes, as you can imagine working in the jackass office, <laughs> but they also just appreciate people who worked hard. And like, that was kind of my mentality at JU and at Pirate Ridge. And especially there was like, uh, if I'm the hardest working person in the room, someone's gonna take notice and they did and I again I started pretty low there I kind of took a step back but there's a foot in the door and after the first season I just said hey I'm, anything I can do to move up and they did they offered me a field producing job and and that worked and uh and then so we did two seasons of MTV um kind of rambling here we did two seasons of MTV and at the after party for season two I think it was at X Games at the after party at some bar and um I was the first one to the after party first one at the bar <laughs> <laughs> and I'm shocked. I'm shocked. And, and this Australian guy comes up to me, and we just start bullshit. And uh, we were chatting, and <laughs> and we'd all hear these rumors about Nitro starting this live tour, like they were going to take what they had been doing for ten years and take starting this live tour. So I met this guy, and then you know, come to find out by the end of the night, he is the guy who's the producer and promoter of this live tour. He basically bought the rights to it, and he was in LA to kind of finish the deal, but also try and find kind of like a stunt coordinator, producer, kind of a creative director for the show. And he and I just met at the bar and he's like, at the end of the night, he's like, I need you to come to Australia tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, I can't go tomorrow, but I can go and later maybe. And we end up talking like the next day and he's like, no, this is real. I want to offer you this job over here. So I, you know, obviously I had to go back to the jackass guys and, tri and trip and say, Hey man, I got this opportunity. You know, are you guys cool? And like, they were about to start filming jackass 3d, which I, I believe I would have had a, a position on that. So it was kind of like, what do I do? And something inside me just said, dude, go to Australia. Um, 
you know, I've always wanted to live overseas. I've always kind of wanted to, to just make a big move. And so I just went for it and just didn't know anyone there. Like sold all my stuff, put my truck in storage and packed one suitcase and a board bag and got to Australia. Just like, screw it. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I signed a six month contract to start the tour and I ended up staying there for almost seven years. Wow. Yeah. You were talking about the pranks. We were talking before we, uh, we went live and, one of the things I remember when you first started over there was it's, your Facebook got hacked probably once a month. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, well, they're they left it open again. <laughs> yeah. No, I wasn't even leaving it open. It was just people would know your password. They would just figure it out. And they would just, yeah, it's just like a thing you do on tour. Cause like I have an office in every building, every arena we go to and the athletes would come in and someone would figure it out. And it got, it got ugly, but it was all in good you, fun. You need, you need better security. All right. <laughs> just, <laughs> password one, two, three, isn't going to work anymore. No. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, so talk a little bit about the live show because I know you guys did it. How many years did the live show? You're still doing it, right? We're still doing it. I mean, how long is right it been now? And in, in this day and age, we're not doing it. Uh, we're sure. you know live events have got hit you know as hard as anyone else. So, but um, but no, we started it in 2010 in Australia. It was our first one, and I can remember like you know going all right. Obviously, Nitro was pretty popular at the time. We did 11 stops in Australia. We sold out. And we're like going in we're like this might not work like, we don't know we've been doing tv for 10 years how do you take you know stunts that work in a movie and put it into a live arena and we were practicing in california for about six months building different ramps and contraptions and trying different people out and finally just came time we're like you know we've run out of time let's just give it a shot we've done everything we can if it works cool if not it was you know it was a good try and it worked and it worked really well and people loved it and we quickly went on to do, you know, travel all over New Zealand and Japan and China and all over Europe many times and all over the States and Canada and um, South Africa. And, you know, it was funny, like after the first tour, like that really worked. Like, you think this will work a second time? We did, you know, did it again. Like, there's no way, like, we'll have three years in us. Like, we'll do three years and we'll max out. And, like, no one's going to give a crap anymore. And here we are 12 years later. And, like, you know, we just sold out shows in Australia at the beginning of the year before COVID. We had a whole tour in the U.S. We had a you know a big event in Wales that all got canceled. So like we're still going strong and like we're kind of gaining momentum. I think that's a credit to us evolving and always progressing. That's you know one thing we've always said: if we're not progressing and, and getting better, then you know what are we doing? And we're just constantly progressing. So so with the longevity that you guys have had, I mean, is it is it something where you're completely reinventing the show? Is it new, new theatrics, new tricks? I mean, what's the pull that's keeping people coming back? No, it's, it's not, I mean, you can't, it's not a whole new show every time, every year, but like, you know, it's just like little subtleties with, with new, you know, videos and, and new stunts and new ramps. Like that's kind of one of our big selling point is we are always progressing ramps and we're to a point now we've got these ramps that are just insanely big and they're hard to tour and you, some of them can't even go indoors. Um, but we're, you know, we're always evolving ramps. The guys are always working on new tricks. And, you know, that's, that's a huge testament to our cast. It's like, they're never, it'd be so easy for them to go, all right, I've got my tricks. I'm done. I'm safe. I got right. to do these. But they just, that's not how they are. That's not how they're wired. They're like, all right, I've done this. Now I got to go bigger. And they just, they, it's something in them. They have to do it. And we encourage it. And we set up places for them to train that's safe with airbags and foam pits. And, um, and yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it's a mix between new ramps and just like kind of new creative to wrap the show in. And then the guys pushing themselves into tricks and finding new talent. You know, we always got, always working on bringing in new people. Sure. Well, we had, uh, I'm sure you saw it, but we put it out ahead of this and, and asked the people, um, you know, if they wanted to ask you any questions. So we're not going to do a more of a hot seat thing. And, and most of these, since uh, we spent time together, we can't ask on air. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll do a show after the show sometime, but um, you know, talking about, you know, all the new tricks and, and these guys pushing the limit. One of the questions that we did have asked was what was one of the scariest moments, um, that you've had on tour? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, I mean, there's a few of them. I think there's a different kind of scary. There's, there's scary when someone does get hurt and that's, that's like the worst part about <clears throat> what we do. And I think especially what I do, like I kind of, part of my, my role before, and I still do it to this day as like athlete manager. I'm very close to these guys. Like, you know, like we travel the world together. We spend months at a time together. Like I love these guys and you know, to see them get hurt is horrible. And, you know, I've seen some horrible things. I've seen, you know, people get paralyzed and I know, that's, you know, there's a couple of those that, you know, that are probably my two, you know, two worst moments of my career by far seeing guys get hurt. But I think the scariest moment, um, 
you know, besides that, because it was something that was about to happen or did happen before it happened. We were in South Africa and we, the two years before my buddy, uh, Eric Rohner, who's since passed away, um, did a base jump off the top of the stadium into the show. And we went back and we're going to attribute to him, but we're like, no, to honor him, we can't just do one person. So we got to do a tandem. So we brought this guy in from California to South Africa and we pulled someone out of the stands and had to do a tandem base jump. That was the scariest moment because like we're taking some random person to strap them to a dude right. and jump 400 feet out of this arch over the stadium in South Africa. Like it should go good. If it doesn't, it's going to be really bad. And it was kind of my idea. And like, I was just sitting there going, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing with my life? Like we're <laughs> lady to some dude. And like, yeah, we're in South Africa where like you can do whatever you want there. But like, I've really got to like see a therapist or something like this isn't good. <laughs> and I was just like, I was just standing there just going like, what have I done? But that and it ended up being fine. Landed. The whole place went nuts. Like kind of the video of it like kind of went around the world. So it was cool. But like that was like the moment I was like, all right. Yeah. I, I can imagine that would, that would be like a little nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the movie. Cause you know, obviously that that's a whole other production. And like you said, you've had the TV show, you've got the live event. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the movie and you know, how that came about and just the process, you know, kind of the differences in the process between the other two versus, you know, a full film. The Nitro movie? Yep. Yeah, so truth be told, I didn't work on that one too much, to be honest. Okay. That was like right in the middle of all of our tours kind of kicking off and I was really hyper-focused on the tours. I did come in and help out with, I think, a couple scenes um, at Trav's and that big crossover. Um, but the movie came about because the, you know, the popularity of the TV show and the tours and, you know, the, the creators of Nitro, uh, Godfrey, Jeremy, and Trav, you know, it's kind of the, the next step, next evolution of like, we've done TV, let's go do a movie. And they got the funding. I, I give those guys so much credit for just swinging for the fences. They just said, let's do it. They did it on their own. They raised their own money. They, they hired their own crew. You know, they didn't have a, a full uh, studio behind them. They just went for it. And, you know, I, I think the movie was great. It was great for our fans. Um, it was great for the tour. It really, you know, it set, set us up for a lot of success for years to follow. So I, I wasn't super involved in the pitching and selling and editing of that again, because I was all over the place, but like, sure. it was a full, you know, a full blown Hollywood movie. Right. Yeah. No, it, it's incredible to see just, you know, the evolution of, you know, like you said, just some buddies who, yeah. you know, like to do, you know, action sports yeah. that's turned into just this massive, brand and following it. It's yeah. just incredible to see. And like you said, to, to have it go on for this long is, is a testament to everyone that's involved. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got a few questions here that I'll throw at you and then I want to get back a little bit to JU. Um, yeah. So one person asked, what was the most unique location that you guys have been on? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate. I, I, I count my lucky stars all the time. I think, you know, I'm very lucky to a, have the most amazing fiance and daughter in the world. But then secondly, like I've seen the world, I've traveled the world over and over. I've done it with an amazing group of people. Um, and I've, I've, like I said, I've seen some unreal things. I've been in some really messed up situations. Um, but I've also, I, I'd have to say like the most amazing, unique place, unique, was that the question? Yeah, unique, but, amazing, I think whatever you want. Mozambique was awesome. We were filming in South Africa, and we take this kind of like military car, we drive over this, the border from South Africa into Mozambique, and this like dirt road, and we're driving, and you can't get out of the car to pee because the roads, there's so many landmines in Mozambique that you just got to hold it until you get to your destination. And we kind of just come up over this hill, and we're just in this like kind of diving surfing resort overlooking this epic, epic uh, beach. And from there, we just did all this amazing, amazing stuff. Got great content from like darting rhinos to, to for research to like, you know, playing with tigers to it's just all this amazing stuff that we just did up in that you know, northern South, South Africa. But just Mozambique itself was like kind of like a pinch me moment. Like, what am I doing here? What have I gotten us into? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, here's one that'll probably get edited out, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What was your favorite bar and why was it Papa Joe's? <laughs> you thank paul kelly you can thank paul kelly for that one <laughs> i was gonna, well paul you're wrong there my friend because i was gonna say the broken spoke the <laughs> broken spoke was my favorite bar of all time i don't even know if it's still there if it is I, i've got no idea i wish it was but i don't know no papa joe's, papa joe's for sure obviously papa joe's 
Um, it's been a few things since, but uh, the building's there, but Papa Joe's is long gone now. So uh, gone, but never <laughs> forgotten. That's right. At least in, in, in our era, for sure. So, um, so let's go back to JU. I mean, I guess the, a generalized question would be, you know, what was your favorite thing about yeah. the university as a whole? I mean, I know we talked around, you know, the, the feel of the campus, um, you know, the camaraderie, things like that. But, you know, just what was the one thing that really stood out to you uh, from your time there? Yeah, I mean, I think... I'll probably be long-winded in this answer again, but like I remember showing up there and like, again, I'm, you know, just an 18 year old kid from Cape Cod, which is a pretty sheltered area. And I get there and my first experience is the, is the soccer team. And like, I don't know if you remember, but like back when I started and it was 98, um, there was a lot of um, Yugoslavians, Serbians, mm -hmm. internationals on the team. And like these, these dudes were men. Like I got there as a, I was a kid, I was a teenager and these guys were men. I mean, they're they, back then they were more of a man than I am now. And they were like, <laughs> like, like, these dudes were like hardened men and like served in the military in their country. Like, we still don't really know how old they were. And they're still great. Like, they were great people. Like, I learned so much from them. And I think I grew so much because I was, you know, embedded in this group of like multicultural, you know, men. There was Hope from Zimbabwe and George from Nigeria and uh, a couple of Brazilians. And it was just like this awesome kind of melting pot that I just, you know, just kind of, you just kind of had to grow up quickly or else, you know, these could kick daddy on the field. But, um, I just remember showing up and, and just seeing all these different types of people that I just wasn't exposed to on the Cape, just being exposed to all these you know, different cultures, different people. And I just remember being like, this is awesome. This is like where I want to be. And like, just thinking, you know, I, I didn't even know that about that when I was going there. And I'm just, you know, you stayed friends with these people all the way through school. And even after, and I think the, the long winded answer is, is the people. I think that's the one thing that I take away from that is, and it's not just, you know, the friends on the team, but just friends around the school, the staff, um, just people in in North Florida in general. Like I just I just fell in love with, with Florida. I, you know, I stayed there for nine years overall, and I think that's the one thing I, I take away from from JU. And and the most thing for is just the people I got to meet, interact with, and maintain friendships. Um, is is that's my favorite part about JU. That's awesome. Well, Dev, I really appreciate the time. Um, any plans to to bring the tour to Jacksonville anytime soon? Yeah, we. I mean. I can't say specifically, obviously, you know, COVID has kind of messed some stuff up, but we did a show in Jacksonville a few years ago. Um, it did great. I think we, we nearly sold out. Um, you know, Florida has been a tough market for us, but long story long, we do have plans to bring an event to Florida, to North Florida very soon. Um, we're in some pretty uh, extensive talks with the government there about this new event that we're working on. So uh, hold your breath because it might be coming soon. Awesome. Well, if you uh, next time you're in town around campus, you know, either officially on official business or leisure, um, we'd love to have you on. We're, we're going to bring this on campus once we're allowed back on as well. So uh, always welcome back on the show. And I, I know you guys always have new stuff going on. So anything, you know, you have new coming on, anything you want to talk about. I know you did um, some some relief work um, on the latest show on ESPN. So anything they're doing like that, anything you want to let uh you know current students alumni know we'd be happy to have you back on cool well when is this gonna air can i plug something <laughs> go for it when is this gonna air uh, a couple weeks couple, oh perfect uh august 16th espn2 the pastrana land pit bike championships watch it it's gonna be awesome we basically held this amazing race in trav's backyard with some of the best races in the world on kids bikes it's great fun and it's airing on the 16th there you go. Check it awesome. Out. <laughs> Dove, thanks again, man. Great seeing you. Great catching thanks, up. Yeah, you too, buddy. Take care. Thanks, bro. Bye.